So I was in the coma, but I could see, hear, and feel everything that was happening. As you allow yourself to be who you are, your purpose will unfold before you. But that's what I feel that it's important for people to know that this is why you're unhappy. It's because you make your decisions from fear. There's nothing to fear. Certainly not death. I don't fear death anymore. Hello everyone, a warm welcome to Wisdom from North. My name is Janneke and I'm now in Oslo at a near-death conference, sitting next to Anita Muriani, who has an incredible story to tell. She was diagnosed with cancer in 2002, and in 2006 she was rushed into the hospital. The doctors gave her mere hours to live. She fell into a coma and she experienced this heavenly kind of realm and she got an understanding of what her life purpose was. 30 hours later, she woke up, and within weeks, her body had fully recovered. There wasn't a trace of cancer in her body. Now, she has written a book about this. It's called Dying to be Me, and in Norwegian, Döden Gamma Liva, and it's been translated into 34 languages. Now, Anita, much, much welcome to Wisdom from North. Well, thank you, and um, it's my pleasure to be here, really. And I've been watching so many interviews, and I've read this book, and um, I started crying reading it because I think the messages are so important. But before we go into like the wisdom part and the knowledge that you gained, can we go back to like 2006 when you uh, were rushed into the hospital? If you can share a little bit about what kind of cancer you had and what happened. All right. I had lymphoma, which is cancer of the lymph glands, and it had spread throughout my lymphatic system, which means, um, you know, the lymphatic system runs all around the neck and the chest. So I had tumors, some of them the size of lemons, starting from the base of my skull, around my neck, uh, my chest, my breasts, under my arms, all the way down to my abdomen. And I had these open skin lesions where toxins were just weeping out of my body. My lungs were filled with fluid. I couldn't lie flat. If I lied down, I would just choke on my own fluid. Um, my muscles were completely wasted away. So I was like a skeleton, literally just a skeleton with skin on it. Um, my arms, my legs, they were really like, like pipes, just really skinny. And because my muscles were wasted away, I couldn't even walk. So I was either constantly kind of sitting or in bed, or if I was taken anywhere, it was by a wheelchair. And I was breathing with the aid of an oxygen tank, a portable oxygen tank all the time. So those were my final weeks before I went into a coma. And the doctors had told my family that I only had about three months to live at best at that time. And then you fell into coma and you realized that you could hear what people were saying around you. Yeah, I could hear them, but more than that, I could even feel what they were feeling. So I was in the coma, but I could see, hear, and feel everything that was happening around my body, but beyond as well beyond my body, and I was aware of everything the doctors were doing, my husband who was by my bedside holding my hand, my mother was there caring for me, and this was in Hong Kong, in a hospital in Hong Kong. And then I became aware even of my brother in India, and he was rushing to catch a flight to come to Hong Kong to catch me before I actually died. So what kind of, um, if you can explain, Explain or try to explain the kind of awareness it was. Were you actually in the airplane with him, or did you just know, or did you see it, or? It was a combination because <clears throat> um, what it felt like was like my consciousness had expanded, so I was no longer focused out of the body. So it's no longer looking with physical eyes but it felt like I was something much greater, and I expanded beyond the room I was in, beyond the hospital, beyond the country, and, 
And so I became aware of just everything. So it was like I had 360 degree peripheral vision. And then whatever I put my focus on, if I put my focus on my brother, doesn't matter if he's on the other side of the world, I was there, I was there with him. If I put my focus on my family, on my mom and my husband, who were by my bedside, you know, as soon as I focused on them, I was there and I was aware of my body lying in the bed dying. So it's just wherever I put my focus on, there I was. How was it like looking at your body? How did you feel? Was there a connection there or? I couldn't believe, it was hard to believe that that small, insignificant body, because it seemed so small and, you know, almost lifeless compared to what I was feeling in that state. It was hard to believe that that was me, because in that state, I felt so powerful. I felt so strong and amazing. You know, I just felt magnificent. It was just, it's just, it makes me emotional to even think about it now. Um, there's no words to describe it. It was like I felt I was encompassed by this unconditional love and and I just felt so powerful. And in, it was in a way that I had never felt before when I was in my physical body. Did somebody meet you? Uh, did you like move farther, farther, farther away from the hospital and then into like this realm? It was like the hospital and all was still there. But I expanded to take in more and take in more further things. And so I encountered my father, who had passed away 10 years prior, my best friend, who had passed away two years prior. So they were also, I was able to, um, I say, see them, but it was a combination of seeing, sensing, feeling, knowing. They were there with me in that realm. So. How does it look like there, in a way? <laughs> well, and was this heaven, you think? It might have been heaven. You know, I, I think different people have different um, images of what constitutes heaven, hell. I actually believe that these concepts we have, like particularly the concept of hell, doesn't exist in, in a realm beyond this one. I think we create our own hell. I believe that that realm is the realm of heaven, but I also believe that we create heaven right here on earth, and that's what I felt. Because when I was in that state, I felt really amazing, but I felt this state of clarity where I just knew that we are meant to create this state here in physical life, basically create heaven here on earth. And that's really what, uh, you know, the feeling that I brought back with me is that we're not supposed to suffer. It felt like we have created our own suffering. We've created the dramas that cause our suffering. But if we knew differently, if we knew that we weren't meant to suffer, we can create heaven right here on earth. Did you receive that uh, from your father, that knowledge, or from your friend, or was it just something that came uh, to you, or did you meet God? To me, um, okay, to me, first of all, I want to say that God is not a physical being that is separate from any of us, because in that state, um, we don't have a physical body. And when you don't have a physical body, I don't have a physical body. When we die, we lose our physical body. Your consciousness, my consciousness, and everybody else's consciousness, there's no separation between us. We merge. We're all one. We share the same consciousness. So there is no entity that is separate from you. You are everywhere. I am everywhere. Right now, we think in terms of separation because we believe that our physical body is all there is to us. But actually, you are much more than your physical body. You are everywhere. And if your body dies, if my body died, I would be able to be everywhere. And I'm not separate from my father or my friend. And actually, I'm not separate from you, which means I'm not separate from God and neither are you. So when we die, 
it's like we merge with God. So you have that clarity un and understanding that God has. You just have it. You don't, nobody has to tell it to you. And it feels like you've woken up from a dream. So in the same way, if you were dreaming and you're struggling and you're dreaming something really terrible, but when you wake up, there's this clarity that, oh, it was a dream. This is what it's really like. That's, that's what it felt like. It's like, oh my gosh, this is what it's really like. That's what it felt like. Do we have um, this knowledge? Is it accessible to us? Can we tap into it right here and now? Yes, we can. We all can. What is really sad and unfortunate is that we were born tapped into it. You know, animals tap into it all the time. Have you noticed animals communicate with each other without words? Even distance is not a problem. How birds can communicate with each other and how they fly together even without communicating. Dogs know when, your pet dog knows when you come home. Uh, you know, it, my dog used to know when I was home and uh, even before I arrived at the door. And so we have this ability to tap into the universal consciousness. We were born with it. But from the time that we're really young, we are taught and conditioned not to trust it, but instead to live from up here. We are conditioned to believe that our physical body and our five senses is all we have, and anything that cannot be seen or touched or heard or felt with our five senses, not to trust it, not to believe it. And it's unfortunate we've been, we've been taught that. It's like we've had our wings clipped. It's like we've been made handicapped with the way that we are taught. Because we are born with this, but it gets conditioned out of us. So basically, it's not something that you need to go out and find and uh, go out and search for you have to actually undo the layers of conditioning. It's already in you. You have to undo the conditioning you have to get to it. And you got this clear understanding that um, why you had cancer yes. and you went back um, and then the cancer disappeared, but the doctors wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Yes, they kept doing the tests over and over and different tests. They said, it's not possible. Cancer doesn't disappear like that. We just have to find it. Finally, they had to give up and say, yes, it's gone. It has gone. And then different oncologists around the world took an interest in my case and have it's my records have been sent to about five different cancer institutes. And one oncologist said, whichever way he looks at it, I should be dead. Mm -hmm. And others have come back and just said they have no, um, there is no record of anybody who has ever come back from such a late stage of cancer um, and to have made such a full recovery at such a rapid rate. So how was it like coming back to this reality with so many limitations when you <laughs> knew that you were actually so big? <laughs> You know, at first it was really frustrating. The, okay, the first initial stage when I came out of the coma, I was euphoric. I was like really happy to be given this, this other chance because I seemed to understand that life is a gift. It's an opportunity. I'm being given an opportunity to create heaven right here. And I felt that I wanted to create it. I wanted to show people how to do it. So it felt amazing, and all I wanted to do was talk about what happened to me and what is important and how important it is to, to love yourself and be yourself and allow your light to shine and so on, and, and, and that the most important thing is to be happy. And I found, though, that it was very challenging because it's like we've created a world or a culture or a society that does not support that way of being. And we have created a society where everybody is hurting, everybody is in pain, everybody is stuck. They're stuck in this conditioning. They're stuck in the roles that they have been doing for decades or centuries, and they can't get out of those roles. And if they try to even do some of the things that they think maybe would lead them to happiness, it means they have to turn against what they've been taught, turn against society, culture, turn against you know our education system, our governments, and so on. So I found it very, very challenging, and I have gone through times when I just felt 
gosh, why, why did I come back? I should have stayed there. Well, your message is very important because um, you believe that you had cancer because of fear. Yes. Because you never knew who you were and you were a people pleaser. <laughs> I was a people pleaser and um, I was someone who had always put myself down, um, sacrificed myself, treated myself like a doormat. Um, I, I was really uh, afraid of my own voice, afraid of expressing myself. I made myself small so others could feel big. I did not value myself. I did not love myself. And every choice, every decision I made in life was out of a fear of consequences, <clears throat> a fear of not being accepted, a fear of wanting to be liked, and so on. So everything I did, I did out of fear, not out of love and passion. And being in that realm, it taught me that's not how I'm meant to live life. Um, so today I know that every decision I make, I make it because I want to do it. So it doesn't matter what the decision is, you know, um, even if you do something good, something positive, even if you want to eat healthy food. I used to be obsessive about eating healthy food, <clears throat> but I used to eat healthy food because I didn't want cancer. Today, if I eat healthy food, it's because I love my life. I want to live long. I want to be healthy. Yeah, there's a great difference there because I heard you talked about that the society is full of fear. We live from fear. Yes. And I realized, oh my goodness, a lot of my actions are coming from fear. Yeah, and society seems to bring us up um, using fear, control us using fear. It's nobody's fault, you know, so I don't want to feed any of these conspiracy theories or anything. It's just the way we all learn. It's not our fault we teach that to the children. It's not teachers' fault that they teach that to their students because it's the way we have been brought up. It's the way our parents have been brought up, and it's the only way we know how. But that's what I feel that it's important for people to know that this is why you're unhappy. It's because you make your decisions from fear. People think that um, we need to teach fear to our kids because it keeps them safe, but it doesn't. Love keeps you safe. If you love yourself and you love your life and you value yourself, you won't put yourself in danger. Love keeps you safe, not fear. Fear immobilizes you. But how is it possible to live without fear when you know that you, for instance, can get hurt in a relationship? You see, the thing is that when you worry about getting hurt in a relationship, what happens is that you don't allow your authentic light to shine through. Everything you do in the relationship will then come from a place of, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to get hurt, so I better not do this, and then I better do this. So you live from your head. You're always calculating about protecting yourself from getting hurt. And then there is this assumption, or you're sending yourself the message that I live in a fearful world, in a dangerous world that's going to hurt me. But if we are taught that it's okay, that even getting hurt is okay, it's not worth dimming your light for the fear of getting hurt, that it's okay, even if I get hurt, it adds to my experience and, one, and I will get over it and I will move on and I will know better the next time when I meet somebody else. But to go into a relationship um, it's so much healthier to feel things like, oh, I want to do this. It brings me so much pleasure to tell my partner, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, that, that I really love you. I love being with you. I love spending time with you. But we're so fearful about doing this. We're also fearful about hearing it because we then think, oh, my God, there's an expectation. What are they expecting from me now? I feel stuck. So we have relationships that are very dishonest. We use words to hide our feelings. Mm. And we have suppressed our feelings. We have suppressed our ability to sense other people's feelings. When you have babies, when you have little children, when you have pets, you know, pet dogs, pet cats, they know what you're feeling without words. Um, and whether you tell your dog, oh, you're such a silly little dog, or whether you tell your dog, you're such a beautiful dog. The dog doesn't care if you say silly or beautiful. The energy is that of loving energy, and the dog knows it. They know what you're feeling. 
Um, if you're angry with the dog, the dog knows what you're feeling. We teach our children not to feel, not to be able to. We teach them to listen to words. We, we cut them off from their natural ability to feel these things, and then we use words to hide what we're really feeling. We disguise our feelings with words. So most relationships today are not based on honest feelings. They're not honest relationships. That's why so many people have dysfunctional relationships that don't work. How can we start working with that now? I mean, I'm like 33 years old. Is it too late? No, it's never too late. As long as you're breathing, it's not not too late. And you're young, by the way. 33 is really young. You're just a baby. Baby, that's nice. So how do I switch that fear? Like how, is it just a thought? Or is, do I have to do anything? In fact, just being aware that you do it is already huge. That's a big thing. And then ask yourself certain questions, like every time you do something, anything, ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing it because I love myself, value myself, value my life, whatever? Or am I doing it because of the fear of consequences? Am I going with this guy because I fear getting old? I fear that I'm not going to get another guy. Am I being with him for that reason? Or am I being with him because I love him? Well, if I, once you realize that, oh, I'm being with him because I love him, and then you feel those feelings, then don't hide them. Just let them come out. Mm. And ask yourself that question for everything you do. Am I stuck in this job because I'm afraid I won't get a better one? Or am I in this job because I really like it? It expresses who I am. Start asking yourself these questions and don't be afraid of the truth. Wow. Be, dare to be vulnerable and brave. Yes. Being vulnerable is the bravest thing. And people are afraid of being vulnerable because we think it's a weakness. Actually, allowing yourself to be vulnerable is the strongest thing you can do. Beautiful. So do you think everybody has a purpose in life? Yes, but I don't think we need to go in search of our purpose. I think all we need to do is allow ourselves to be who we are, be authentic. Ask yourself, what makes me feel passionate? What brings me joy? What makes me happy? Um, What makes me laugh? These are clues to finding out who you are. As you allow yourself to be who you are, your purpose will unfold before you. Beautiful. And what is, how do you perceive reality now? I, I know that you've experienced time in a different way in that realm. Yes. Time is not linear in the way we think it is, but we perceive it to be linear. In actuality, all of time exists at once, and that's what it felt like in in the other realm. It felt to me like all of time, all my lifetimes, were I could see them all existing simultaneously. We have access to a lot more than we think we do. We think that we have to physically go research information, so we go outward um, for all our information. One of the last places we go to, if we even go, is to go inward and ask ourselves answers to questions. Um, But in actuality, when you go inward, and I say inward, but actually your essence is much bigger than your physical body much bigger and your essence is pure consciousness your essence is connected to everybody else's essence your essence is part of the universal energy universal consciousness so when you contact you go inward and contact your own essence you have access to huge amount of information energy power all kinds of things much more than if you were to get on the internet and do your research for what you should eat. People go on the internet to try and find out what we should eat, what were diagnosis for our symptoms and so on. I used to do that and all that does is it makes you more fearful and it makes you more obsessive and it makes you go, go out and, and, and buy huge numbers of supplements because you think this supplement will help me for this and that and the other. I don't do that anymore. I just go inward and I ask my body, what do you want now? What is it you need to support yourself? Or what do I need? 
What do I need now to support myself, to support me, nurture me emotionally, physically, and I just listen to my body or listen to my consciousness? Is that a meditation or can you just uh, ask? You can tune in and ask any time and see what comes to you. I get it in the form of visions or visuals. I get visual images of, for example, of what I should you know, what direction I should be going, what foods I should eat, and so on. I get visual images whenever I do ask. Um, and, it's, and it's very helpful to me. I went through a phase where I was feeling really, really run down and weak. And so I was going on the internet and looking for things that could increase my energy. And, you know, old habit, go on the internet, look for things that increase my energy. I was trying everything. And it wasn't working. I was feeling weaker. And so I thought, how silly of me. I talk to people about getting in touch with themselves. I should be taking my own advice. So I tuned in, and I saw these. the visions that came up was protein-based foods. I saw eggs. I saw salmon. I saw chicken. And I thought, ah, oh, my body is starved of protein. And all I had to do was just eat protein. Eat, I ate boiled eggs. I ate salmon. And the energy just came back almost instantly. And, um, you know, funny thing is I don't know why I don't get images of ice cream and chocolates. Mm. But <laughs> <laughs> So do you think we are um, in a uh, state uh, where we are awakening now in this time? That there was a reason for why this happened to you? That you're one of those people who are going to help this uh, shift uh, come? I feel that many people are um, are beginning to become aware of new things. Like a, it is like an awakening, and I feel that in my in my own case, it's almost like I feel that it was a timing thing. I think if this happened to me 20 years ago, people would have rejected it or said I was crazy or something. And what I have really been fortunate with is the amount of support that I have got. It's like people are ready for uh, to hear of an experience like this. People are hungry for it. People are ready for it. I don't think I did anything special. I just think the timing was right and the people are ready for it. And I believe everybody is capable of doing what I did. I don't think in any way that I'm special. I think everybody is enlightened. Everybody is powerful, everybody is magnificent. The only difference between people is whether they realize it or not. That's the only difference. We are all spiritual, it's just whether we realize it or not. And there's nothing to fear? There's nothing to fear, certainly not death. I don't fear death anymore. And um, so death is not something to fear and when you don't fear death, you don't fear life either. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much. Is there anything you want to share in the end? I just want people to know that um, the most important thing that you can do is, well, first of all, I say the most important thing is to learn to laugh again. You know, when we are born, when we are babies, when we're children, we laugh a lot and we lose that. Laughter is so important. Don't take life seriously. Most of our religions, spiritual systems, political systems, education systems, medical systems, all take, our, take life far too seriously. You need to lighten up, don't take life seriously, and you'll find that if everybody learned to laugh, including our politicians, our doctors, our teachers, if everybody learned to laugh, we'd have a very different world, mm -hmm. and we would have less illness, less crime, less war, less everything. <laughs> Thank you so much. This mm -hmm. was beautiful. Thank you. It was my pleasure. I loved it. <laughs> And uh, you can go into my site and you can actually buy this book. I really recommend it. It's beautiful, has a beautiful message. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Much light from Oslo. Bye.